Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Shirk, and this is my talk on BSD honeypots with Zeek. Of course, it runs on BSD. It'll be a short little discussion here about using Zeek with the FreeBSD jail to deploy honeypots. Uh, I like to start off with just a basic introduction, uh, then work into what is a honeypot for those that maybe not have heard of that term before, a brief history of honeypots, and then kind of what created this talk as far as my case study uh, for setting up FreeBSD uh, with a honeypot. Um, as always, my rant warning, if I basically have Beastie with the hammer sitting there next to any piece of information, I might be ranting without any evidence. Uh, everything else is cited in the talk, and if it's something based on my personal experience or opinion, I put an asterisk next to it. Um, short history, uh, just we've been working with IDS for uh, a number of years, uh, supporting open source tools. Snort, I maintain the full fork uh, Perl script. Um, also, uh, operating systems, I support FreeBSD, op, uh, OpenBSD, HardenBSD, as well as all the security tools, Snork, uh, Suricata, Zeek running on them. I also maintain the FreeBSD ports for Zeek, uh, the, for, uh, for the uh, package manager, as well as B-Test, just to keep that up to date. Um, I, myself, a consultant, co-owner of my business, named Security Incorporated. Uh, I use HardenBSD, OpenBSD, and Free, but of course, customers uh, typically have Linux. I uh, work uh, as an assistant professor for our community college in the cybersecurity program. And if interested in just BSD, there might be a, a BSD user group in the area, but I run the one that's actually in the Baltimore area and doing that for a number of years. Uh, so basic definition, um, what's a honeypot? Well, it's kind of like a pot of honey that attracts things, you know, bees or bears, but kind of a more useful definition. A honeypot is a closely monitored network decoy, uh, which, uh, has sort of several purposes. It can dis uh, distract adversaries from a valuable system on a network, early warning about new attacks. Uh, good definition from uh, Provost, but kind of breaking that down, what am I talking about? So if I have 30 systems out there, you know, maybe there's like only 10 of those systems that are actually the real systems I'm using for processing. The other ones are simulating the actual systems as decoys. So attackers might hit those instead of the actual real systems. For new attacks and exploits, deploy a honeypot to detect potentially a, a new exploit of an HTTP server vulnerability uh, or adversary. So have it so it looks like it's a real system, the attacker interacts with the honeypot, and now I can start gathering, you know, are they downloading additional tools? There might be additional IOCs, TTPs, uh, for those familiar with the MITRE attack framework, for security researchers to pick up on. Um, now they provide kind of a benefit here. Security research don't have a lot of details to kind of jump into what I had for this particular uh, Citrix application delivery controller exploit. I mentioned this in my other uh, longer talk because it's actually running FreeBSD and it was a pretty uh, serious vulnerability. But honeypots deployed and people were able to pull in that information and uh, develop uh, detections for them. Uh, and business operations. So you can deploy decoys around your actual systems for uh, attackers to target instead of your real systems. But also the fact that you're not just going to start your security program by deploying a bunch of decoys, make sure you're at a high security level before uh, kind of moving into this deceptive services. Um, the honeypot can be, you know, a client just to connect to a server. So like an AD client, like an LDAP type of uh, uh, configuration, or even as a web browser connecting to a web server. Uh, all, you know, typically, at least from my experience, I've done it a lot with just, uh, services. So it looks like a web server. It looks like a real database sitting out on the line. Uh, you have low, medium, and high. So low basically just looks like it's the right protocol, but maybe if an attack were to do something, there's not a lot of uh, interaction. Medium, a little bit more of a protocol support, and a high interaction honeypot, more of something that would simulate a real system. So I'm able to SSH in with a password, a password, and now it looks like I'm on a real system. So a high interaction type of honeypot. Uh, the concept goes back in computing. Uh, the cuckoo's egg, for those that have not read it, is a very interesting uh, first-hand account of a computer intrusion at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, as Stoll uh, utilized essentially a fake department as a honeypot to catch a spy. So kind of like that first, you know, trying to reach back as far as the history of something that talks about honeypots. Um, the Deception Toolkit, Fred Cohen, a lot of other services. So the idea of having network services that are out there simulating things and collecting information on what attackers are doing. And uh, with that, HoneyD, which came around, I, I have 2003 here, looks like it was released in 2002, uh, uh, but Nils Provost, you know, created Honeydee, 
and it's basically simulating network stack behavior for older operating systems. Um, so older kind of a diagram here, something looks like it's going to be communicating with uh, this, like this one of these particular IP addresses. Uh, then you have your Honeyd configuration so that it answers the ARP request and provides the services. So early on use of uh, a network service that would answer specific ARP requests for uh, each of the honeypots you're trying to simulate. So uh, the thing is systems in 2020, who's not using something virtualized? Um, so you don't have as much of that physical hardware that you have lying around like you used to. Um, On-prem cloud-based architectures, it's kind of easy to do this stuff nowadays. You just, and, and, and you're simulating, you know, virtualized environments right next to your real environments. Um, random ports open on the internet, uh, kind of like what I call the new normal. And, you know, internet of things, or what some call the internet of trash, you pick. There's billions of devices out there. So having just something sitting on the wire that looks kind of suspicious is almost a new normal. I have additional talk, uh, talk reports that I had for my BSD CAN talk, but this was really just covered looking at HoneyD, using it with OpenBSD, and HoneyTrap that I'll mention a little bit later, which is a much nicer uh, package that I did not use for my case study um, because I essentially selected uh, one that I found from a list. Um, and that's why I kind of have this note here. This is not the best all solution. It's kind of what I did for this proof of concept. I selected HoneyPy. And uh, I'm going to get into a little bit of why for this particular case study that I was using this. Also, uh, as I get to this next section, there is, we're not going to have enough time to kind of stop on some of these slides, but I, the slides will be made available. And I have a lot of the configurations step by step that were used to set up everything for this um, setup of using FreeBSD uh, with the Honeypot. So I, I'll skip those, uh, kind of like highlight the key areas, but this stuff will be all be made available for everyone. But the story began where a company was trying to produce threat data. And at the time, there was no kind of security research going on. Like you might have just, here's your primary internet connection, but then you also have the security research, uh, you know, the, I'll call it the dirty net, dark net, whatever, uh, you know, it would just be the place you'd have fun. Put vulnerable services out there, maybe even use it for penetration testing. Um, but they needed to configure something uh, to monitor for potential threats and use that as a, as a means to share with their customers. And I was like, of course this will run on BSD. Why not just set up a free BSD jail? And what I had done is just for, remember back Mariah infections, 2016, 2017, I simply just set up a jail and use INETD to uh, enable the Telnet service. It was just collecting data. So with just one simple configuration change, uh, I basically had a honeypot or maybe it's a deceptive service, but you know, if you don't know what INETD is, it's back when we actually cared about system resources and trying to save a megabyte. And technically that was back in the four dot three days of BSD. Uh, uh, when that was created. So I could set up a jail as a honeypot, but I could also use another jail to monitor that traffic from uh, uh, from within the host. So that's where I uh, just initially looked for uh, Zeek using available threat data. So I set up a just an instance out there in DigitalOcean. Any cloud service provider should work for this, but I would get the, the single IP address. Um, and the uh, did each jail would be configured to kind of, uh, you know, and do a redirection, which I'll show in a minute. And for the jail management, um, I used IOCage, which was my first time using it. And I always like uh, talking about Michael W. Lucas's books. As a great book, if you're interested in more FreeBSD jail management, uh, I used kind of the examples there for some of the stuff I did for the talk for setting up and using IOCage. So this is just an example. So I'm going to be redirecting all the traffic to PF. This is just uh, the bottom here. The key points are the NAT and uh, redirect rules. And as you can see here, anything coming into the host will be, uh, for port 22, will be redirected to the HoneyPy uh, system on port 10,022. We'll get to that in a second. So each redirect rule for every service that I would have to do. Uh, you'll see the HoneyPy uh, output that I'll have in a minute that has a lot of services. But the idea is if I'm emulating an HTTP server, if I'm emulating an SSL uh, uh, TLS connection, uh, even like Elasticsearch, you'll see, I have to do a redirect. So that's just an extra rule that I have to put into my packet filter uh, PF configuration. I also set up aliases uh, locally for these jails uh, on the FreeBSD host. Once to ensure that you just set the, the sys control, these are the settings within FreeBSD, 
you just enable gateway enable, that automatically sets the correct IP forwarding uh, for taking anything you receive to your host and redirecting to the local jail, enabling PF, and then rebooting the virtual instance. Uh, so these are all the steps um, that you basically install IO cage, and it's assuming that you're using ZFS, ZFS for those uh, that also uh, like to, you know, that stuff that's also available on Linux as far as your file system. Uh, but uh, IO cage essentially creates a base jail. And then with these create commands, I create an instance for this case, HoneyPy, give it an IP address and base it on a specific FreeBSD release. Uh, I then the set boot on ensures that the, the every time the system turns and reboots, that um, IO cage, when it starts, will also start these jails. Uh, so for the packages in the jails, so instead of having to like change, you know, you, you could usually just open a console on the jail, but package, the FreeBSD package management, allows it to be very easily just used within IO cage. So this is just installs the basics, Python 2. Uh, and then for Zeek, um, the same thing. Essentially, all I did was update the, the jail and run package Zeek install. Uh, that's, that's it. Zeek is a uh, already a package within FreeBSD operating system, so nothing else there. It pulls down everything. Uh, the bottom is the specifics for pulling down HoneyPy. Uh, like I say, I'm going to go a little bit quicker here, but uh, this, the slides we made available. Uh, so there's an issue with Telnet being emulated. So this is why I had to do a copy of the services configuration for it uh, to then make a backup and then uh, just to, to kind of go through and then set up everything by hand. Uh, it makes it kind of a nice logging output, which we'll, we'll show in a second. And a lot of very, so this is kind of like a low interaction, the medium. Uh, the example here is for low interaction, just to get stuff and running, to use it to echo back whatever it receives. Um, so this is a simple configuration for SSH where it's just doing echo. Uh, there, there was no capability at the time for doing, uh, you know, SSH service emulation, something I found later that uh, Honeytrap did quite nicely. Uh, so the, uh, the redirect um, is important. That's where you saw the PF uh, rules in the first part of this. So the idea is for all TCP port 22 traffic will be redirected to TCP port uh, 10,022 on the jail. And once HoneyPy is running, it's whatever you configure as a service that it will use as your, uh, uh, you know, for whatever protocol you're trying to emulate. And I had the two examples here where you don't have to go in, this is from within the jail, or you can use IO cage to just directly execute a command uh, within the context of the jail to get it up and running. So not really fancy, just running a, a Python script. And this is showing like a lot of the services I configured. Most of them uh, were the echo plugin just to kind of get up and running, uh, but there was HTTP service, uh, the DN, there was a plugin for DNS and a plugin for SMTP, Elastic, um, but I just wanted to kind of get it up and running and make things work. So an example of the log event, so something connected over SSH, and I just, uh, the, the, the plugin just, of course, responds back. But if you take this, the hex string here, it's essentially just like a PuTTY connection. Um, so the question is, yeah, is that someone using PuTTY, or is it just some kind of random scanner? Now, we'll pause with the, some of the time I have left. Most important part for this is you have the two jails, but they are not allowed by default to read the interface that I have as the FreeBSD host. Therefore, I have to create a DevFS rule to unhide uh, uh, the BPF filter uh, for the ability for the jail to see traffic. This would be set up for the Zeek jail. So once that's set up, I set the DevFS rule, and then I, within IO cage, when the jail runs, I set this rule set uh, for the Zeek jail. So only the Zeek jail has the ability to see, you know, the full, if I do a, a TCP dump, I can see the full log and the same way that I would configure Z. Now I can, I left this in, but essentially for those that, you know, Z has a wonderful Intel uh, framework for, you know, bringing in stuff uh, that are specific IOCs. Uh, it's something that Suricata can do. You see a lot, uh, a little bit of a push for some of that, but I'm just more familiar with how Zeek does the pulling in of input information as well as uh, Intel data. And, and the goal is to combine various feeds for me. Uh, MISP is something I think I can set up on a FreeBSD box, but others might be familiar with MISP. That allows for uh, information sharing, and it's something to kind of look at that might be a little bit better than the scripted stuff that I did. Um, tabs are important if you haven't heard a little bit of that today already. Uh, so this is an example of just an input 
uh, uh, Intel file tabs. Uh, and, and basically, as long as you format the file this way, create your own Intel uh, feed, and then have that ready to deploy. This is a from uh, Zeek uh, 306. Just looking at some of the, the address type URL, um, uh, typically domain, but other uses that are you know available. I haven't explored a lot of them, uh, but these are indicator types that you can basically look for in your network traffic. So bare bones setup, try to go, we're starting to run a little bit low on time, but the uh, how to get the Intel framework up and running, point it to a specific Intel file that you have and ensure that Zeek will start so every time my jail restarts, Zeek will start up and start processing the information. Uh, two other things, this is just basic configuration stuff. Uh, just a quick change to the IP address for the Zeek jail and changing the standard E0, even uh, with the FreeBSD port, it's just the default that you get from the code checkout. Make sure that's set to the correct interface. And then I'm just executing Zeek control deploy to uh, deploy out the configuration. Uh, so with the fake services running, um, IOCs, you know, this is something that basically can correlate uh, the hits to the Intel to provide some fidelity of the IOC data that you have. So can reduce time on the incident response, you know, when you're actually looking at scanners. So this was a connection attempt in which uh, using the UID, you can see here correlating across all the logs, and that correlates directly to just some SSH uh, scanning activity. Looks like it came from an emerging threats compromised IP as an example. So this was the case study, the initial setup, um, you know, I correlated everything and there's additional things to do on top of this to build out, but this will at least get you started or how to have two jails set up and monitored. Um, the, uh, if you're not familiar too, uh, Shodan has the ability to kind of type in an IP address and say whether it's a honeypot or not. And, and so far my system still looks like a real system. If anything, it looks like a FreeBSD firewall redirecting traffic, you know, not a cloud instance. Uh, you know, hosting a honeypot jail. Um, so there's some, you know, value here for your custom log. So looking at, you know, are your IOC is good? Are you just looking at specific scanners? Are they hitting other systems? And, and you know, MISP has the ability to age out some things. And I made a note here for JGRASS's uh, ability to expire some Intel um, items. So there's a way to kind of keep, you know, adding adding new indicators, aging them out, and just kind of, uh, you know, keeping, keeping your Zeek jail uh, up to date as you monitor for attacks. Uh, there's also, if you're not familiar with gray noise, um, you can have other APIs, but this is the one I just wanted to use for this testing in which I can verify, is this just a scanner? Is this someone actually attacking my system? It's kind of difficult to see, uh, but uh, essentially it looks like some kind of SSH brute force that I was receiving for that uh, log alert that was in the first part of these slides. So at least it's an example of setting up a honeypot on BSC operating systems. Um, you know, there's other things you might be able to take a look at, such as I saw this attack hit the honeypot from this specific host. Is there anything else I can see from this host? So ways of correlating this data into more meaningful threat information. So BSD operating systems are well suited uh, for honeypots and, you know, kind of share the history of also on the OpenBSD side. I'm hoping soon to have what I, I'm calling BSD NSM. And it, because of some of the interest in the honeypots, I'm, I'm looking to add that as a feature. So essentially, you can set up an NSM uh, uh, system with uh, Zeek Suricata or Snort in a jail, and then the ability to kind of turn on Honeypot as a feature. Like I say, Honey Trap, I'm a little bit more interested in. Seems to be a little bit more robust and depth than what I was doing. And the hope for this is at least, you know, start using BSD operating systems over Docker images for uh, uh, specific uh, Honeypots. So I thank you. References. I had it in here for questions, but thank you very much.